Well, good morning. <clears throat> As the old Southern Baptist preacher said, if that doesn't light you fire, your wood's wet. Uh, if you have your Bible, I invite you to turn to Psalm 90. Psalm 90 is where we will uh, be this morning. Uh, and so as we are continuing in our uh, Psalms of Summer, uh, we have a few more weeks uh, before uh, we dive back into Acts. And so I'm, I have enjoyed uh, walking through the Psalms. Somebody asked me this morning uh, uh, if I've enjoyed teaching through the Psalms versus just going, you know, start to finish in the book of Acts. I said, yeah, it's been, you know, but it's, it's difficult because it's like we get done on a Sunday. It's like, all right, well, what, what's the next Psalm we're going to do? Uh, versus in Acts, it's like we just teach what's next, right? And so anyway, uh, I'm going to do something a little different this morning. I want to give you, before I read Psalm 90, uh, I want to give you some context of uh, when Moses penned it. And so this is the only psalm in the book of Psalms that Moses uh, had written. So there's a good chance that it's older than most of the other psalms. And uh, there's a couple other times, you know, we have the song of Moses uh, that we see when they cross the Red Sea. But this is what many people think that this was really, he wrote this towards the end of his life. Uh, probably historically speaking, you can look at Numbers 20, uh, it would have been in that time. And so let me kind of tell you what happens in Numbers 20, uh, which, which most scholars think uh, as a result of Numbers 20, we have Psalm 90. And so in, in Numbers 20, first thing that we happen when you get there is Miriam, the, the sister of Moses, dies. Uh, and they were really, obviously, really close. Uh, she had been with him for a while. So she passes away. A few verses after that is whenever Moses strikes the rock out of anger, which in turn the judgment of God is, you're not going to the promised land. And if it couldn't get any worse after that, the end of Numbers 20, his brother Aaron dies. And so Moses is now in this moment in his life, he's lost his brother and his sister, these hoodlums that he's been leading for the past 70 years or whatever, you know, the, the time that they've been in the wilderness, as he's gotten so frustrated, he acts out of anger, and now he can't even go to the promised land he's been trying to lead them to. The dude's at a spot that he's probably thinking about life and death. He's thinking about frustration, right? He's thinking about uh, failure. He's thinking about all kind of emotions that were probably going that me and you can sympathize with, right? Like we, not that we've been... Re- God hasn't told us you're not coming to the promised land. Thanks because of Jesus, we know that we will spend eternity with him. But life and death, we, we're familiar with. We, we're familiar with loss. We're familiar with uh, just contemplating. And, you know, the Bible actually tells us, uh, as much as our culture doesn't like to think about death, the Bible actually tells us it's important for us to think about those things. Matter of fact, in Ecclesiastes, it says, it says it's better to go to a funeral than to a place of feasting. Uh, because death is the end result for all who are alive. Uh, and there's it's actually a healthy place for us to actually contemplate death and think about death. Matter of fact, this psalm tells us to ask God to, to teach us to number our days. With, in a nutshell, literally means to, to know that our days are numbered. Like before we breathe our first breath, God already knows our last, right? And so we don't, we don't like to think about those things, but the Bible teaches it's actually healthy and actually wisdom that can be gained by undercoming to that understanding. Not that we're morbid people that just walk around as Debbie Downer or Johnny Rainclouds, uh, but, th- but that we actually understand that this life isn't forever, that there is an expiration date. And, and whenever we can get to that place that we, we healthily accept that, man, life there's much life to be lived, right? Uh, but it, so that's kind of, sorry, I got ahead of myself, but that's the, the context of, uh, of Psalm 90. So now let's go to Psalm 90. Now, it's 17 verses, so bear with me. I'm going to read it all. Uh, but it says this, Psalm 90, the title of it is From Everlasting to Everlasting. It says, A Prayer of Moses, the Man of God. What a, what a cool terminology to be uh, the man of God, uh, This is what Moses writes, or he's praying. He says, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth or ever, you had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting. You are God. You return man to dust and say, return, O children of man. Now now that you know the context, you can see what's going on in his mind. He's thinking about death. He says, you return man to dust and say, return, O children of man. For a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it, it is past, or as a watch in the night, 
You sweep them away as with the flood, they are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and it is renewed, in the evening it fades and it withers. For, you are brought to an, for we are brought to an end by your anger. By your wrath we are dismayed. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. For all our days pass away under your wrath. We bring your years, you bring our years to an end like a sigh. The years of our life are 70 or even by reason of strength 80. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger or the, your wrath according to the fear of you? So teach us to number our days so that we might Get a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? Have pity on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, for as many years as we have seen evil. Let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our, of our hands. Let's pray. Father, we love you. God, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you for this opportunity, opportunity to gather this morning and, and hear from our brothers who have been serving you on the other side of the world. God, I thank you for using them. God, I thank you for our time to be able to worship together. Now, God, as we come to your word, God, that we pray that you will give us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to believe and and faith to obey that which you call us to this morning. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. And so I'll be honest with you, when I first came to this text, I was sharing with Luke this morning, when I first came to Psalm 90, because it's not like we're like flipping a quarter, like which Psalm do we do? Uh, but it's it sometimes, I right, well, what's what I feel, you know, where I feel the Lord leading. Uh, and so when I first came to this Psalm, it was because of uh, verse 12, one that we have, so teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. I was like, hey, it's summer, let's just talk about wisdom and how it's important for us to, you know, think about life. And then as I got to studying it, uh, the more and more I saw that, that me and my day wasn't the central theme of this psalm. Like me even contemplating my own death is not the central theme to this, this psalm. When Moses is writing it, he's not just, it's not matter of fact. Did you know in the 17 verses, there's only one, one verse in the 17 that have just us. All the other 16 is about God and him being from generation to generation, him being steadfast love or asking him to do something. This psalm is about the everlasting, unchanging God. And no matter what circumstance Moses had found himself in, whether it was the death of a brother or a sister, or the, the, the judgment that he received from God to not go to the promised land, whenever, and this is going to be key for us, I'm, I'm going to get ahead of myself, Moses was interpreting those things through whom he knew God to be first. And that's, that's a very important life lesson that we, me and you would be do, doing good to understand. As many times we try to interpret God through the things that's going on in life. To where Moses was interpreting life through who he knew God to be. And who God had been to him and for him. His, his lens at deciphering this crazy thing called life where there's life and death was who he knew God to be first. Uh, and so anyway, that's not even a part of the text. But anyway, so... What I began to see is the gospel more and more. And so, Justin, I don't see it. Uh, we're going to walk through it. Uh, last year, I told you this when we were talking about being a gospel driven or gospel centered church, is that a gospel driven church would be a church that's always reminding. And we're always remembering right, through, through the Lord's Supper, but we're also always reminding ourselves. And we get that from 1 Corinthians 15 when Paul writes to the Corinthians and says, Brothers, I would remind you of the gospel. You know, and I say this often, but man, we need to be reminded of the gospel often. And so even in the book of Psalms, when we're talking about numbering our days, this morning I want to remind you of the gospel. That this psalm that looks like we're in a world of hurt because, because of God's judgment, our days are numbered. It looks like... What's the hope is that through the gospel, God has reversed that judgment to where we can actually have joy in this life. 
And so I'm going to remind you of the gospel. I'm going to remind you this morning, the songs that we're singing, why, we can, why you and I can sit here understanding, contemplating death, and death has actually lost its sting. Right. All right, like we sing it, but how, how? how? Why can I sing that? And I think oftentimes we forget about that. Why? Because we live as if our days aren't numbered. We live each and every day like there is no end in sight. Like there is no eternity that we will step into one day. Think about our priorities. Think about how we spend our week. Think about the things that we do and things that we don't do. And everything's getting centered around as if this life is going to last forever. We're building kingdoms with sand as the foundation, oftentimes, that we can't take with us. But anyway, let's go to the text where we'll see the gospel, because I'm going to remind you of the gospel this morning, because... We don't always wake up, as we say, in what? Gospel mode. I don't. Butch, appreciate that. Me and Butch are the only ones that need to be reminded of the gospel. We don't wake up every day going, I can't wait to serve Jesus today. I can't wait to to serve somebody else. Right? Like, think about your commute to work. Me and Ashley have been joking a lot lately uh, and, and we need to stop because Evie's called on, but it's like, look at all these people that are in my way. I'm trying to get somewhere, right? Like their, their whole purpose in life is just to keep me from getting where I'm supposed to go. It's my world. They're just living in it, all right? So we always joke like, come on, car, move. So now Evie's like, move, car. It's like, baby, <laughs> just, just calm down. Or, or, or we get up to a red light and uh, Emma will go, why are we not moving? We got to keep going. It's like, but no, baby, I, I literally do have to stop at this moment. So anyway, we need to check ourselves, but we need to remind it of the gospel because we don't always operate in gospel mode. So that's what I want to do this morning. First of all, if you're taking notes, what we see is that God, this is where Moses starts in the psalm, is that God is everlasting and he's unchanging. That God is everlasting and he's unchanging. And this is to remember the context. Both siblings are gone. He's not going to the promised land. And whenever he's praying to God in that context, he starts by addressing God and who God is. Right? Like he, you ever, you ever read these Psalms and prayers? It's like all they're doing is telling God who God is. Yeah, God knows who he is, but he, he likes to hear who he is. But what it does oftentimes when whenever we're t- telling God who he is, it's an act of us reminding ourselves who God is. And so that's what we see Moses doing here. So he says, Lord, you have been our dwelling place. And automatically, all of our mind goes to, hey, the main focus of this is that dwelling place, right? Because I, we're, we're softies. We like to be safe and secure and things like that. And we look at this psalm, and it's like, all right, that's the focus here. All right, that's where our hearts go, right? God, and that's true. Truth is that God is our hiding place or our, our dwelling place. He is our refuge. And if you want to know more about that, just read Psalm 91. The whole thing is about being God, being our refuge. But I, I want to turn your attention to what I think the main theme of this text is, because he says this, Lord, you have been a dwelling place. What's the next three words? In all generations. I think that's the theme of this psalm, because in a second, he's going to contrast that with God's being everlasting to everlasting to us not being. All right, so he, he, he says, Lord, you have been a dwelling place in all generations. Moses isn't just marveling at God being our dwelling place. He is marveling at God's unchangeableness or his immutability, his, his, his everlasting. It depicts in verse 2, it says, this is how he has been for all generations. It says, before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, and this is how he talks about God. From everlasting to everlasting. Like one everlasting is enough, right? But he says, from everlasting to everlasting, this is who you've been. You have been this dwelling place. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. So he starts this psalm by talking about and and proclaiming that God is faithful, that God is who he is from generation to generation. And I got ahead of myself earlier but this is something for us to, that we need to comprehend because this is how we should navigate our trials and failures and struggles. Is understanding that, because some of you may find yourself in here in one side of Moses, maybe you come in and you're thinking about loss, 
right? When I talked about, when, when I talked about Miriam and Aaron dying, your mind automatically went to loss. I want to remind you out of just verse one is that, that God has been a dwelling place from generation to generation. From everlasting to everlasting, he's the same faithful God. For some of you, you may resonate with the failure side of Moses in Numbers 20. Maybe you haven't struck, struck a rock, made water come out of it, because if you did, do it again, I want to see it. Uh, maybe you haven't done that, but there's this failure that's deep within you right now. Even as a child of God, there's this failure that you feel like you just can't get off of you, just clinging to you, that the enemy is constantly whispering, this is, this is who you are, that God, God has forgotten you. I want to remind you that he, even this disrespectful, dis whatever Israel, that he was their dwelling place, generation to generation, from everlasting to everlasting, even in their failures. And maybe you need to be reminded of that this morning. That no sin in your life, child of God, has undone what Christ has already done in you and for you. That he hasn't regretted saving you. That he would he, he, he hasn't regretted sending Christ to die on a cross because he, he is in his covenant. And he, we haven't used it, he hasn't used the word covenant or the covenant name of God yet, but he will. But God's business is about his covenant that he has created with his people. Anyway, let's keep going. So what we see in verses 1 and 2 is that God is, is everlasting and he's unchanging, that he is who he is. He's self-sufficient within himself from everlasting to everlasting. He has no beginning. He has no end. He has no expiration date. His days are not numbered. Everybody catching me? It's important. We got to catch that contrast. Second thing we see, really in verse 3, is that man is not everlasting. So Justin, that's super simplified. That's exactly how it's supposed to be. God is everlasting and unchanging. He is who he is. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He's unchanging in his character and the way he acts, the way he, 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 he responds, the way he treats. He's unchanging. Yet man is not everlasting. He starts it in verse 3 and it says, you, notice here that who's, who's sovereignly doing these things. I, so I, well, another, here's a take home for you, is that this thing called life, it isn't happening by accident. That God's actually sovereign even over life because who's, who's making the man go to dust or who's making the days go by? It's God. He says, you return man to dust and say, return, O children of man. Here he's beginning to introduce that man is not everlasting. Obviously Moses knows that because his brother and his sister just died. But he is processing what's going on in the presence of God. He says, God, you are everlasting and everlasting, and you are in charge of our life. And whenever it's our time to go, you say, Get back, go back to the dust. And he explains it even more in verse 4, just how not everlasting we are in this life is. He says, for a thousand years in your sight is... Uh, your sight are but as yesterday and when it's past. And so uh, what he's saying is if we were to live a thousand years, it's still nothing compared to the, who, the everlasting, the everlasting God is. And he says, is it of yesterday? But then he says, as a watch in the night. Literally, that means four hours. There's a four-hour watch at night. And he says, if we were to live a thousand years, that's like four hours to you. You're everlasting to everlasting. Our life it's like this. Verse 5, you, you sweep them away as with flow. Speaking of our days and our years, you, you, you sweep them away as with, with the flood. They are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. And in the morning it flourishes and renewed, but in the evening it fades away and it withers. See, here's what Moses is praying because he's didn't. This wasn't a sermon he was praying. He was literally praying these things to God. When Moses was confessing to God, is God, you are everlasting to everlasting, but unlike you, I'm not. And you're not. We're not. We are mortal. Our lives are very brief. Five to six, as I just read, drives that. Drives that. It says they just sweep them away as with the flood and like a dream. Like literally that, that, that imagery there is, I took a nap and I woke up. I was like, wait, did I, was I dreaming? 
It's that quick. That's how quick and, and, and brief life actually is. The Bible drives this home in, in James 4.14. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then it vanishes. Psalm 39, behold, you have made my days a, a few handbreadths, and my lifetime has nothing before uh, my lifetime is as nothing before you. Surely all mankind stands as a mere breath. Job 9.25 says, My days are swifter than a runner. In Ecclesiastes, I think this is going to come up on the screen, and this is what I was talking about at the beginning, is that the Bible wants us to arrive at this place, that we think about on mortality. It says, It is better to go to the house of the morning than to go to the house of the feasting, for this is the end of all mankind, and, all, and the living will all lay it to heart, which means they will contemplate it. Not in just this morbid, I'm fearful of it, but there's much wisdom to be gained. And, you know, I'm, I know I'm only 35, and if you're older than my 35, you say, you're just a young whippersnapper. Uh, but I'm not as young as I used to be, right? Like, and the older I get, like, 70 used to feel like, and he actually scared me because he used a 70 in here. Uh, but, uh, you know, 70 used to feel like so far away. And that's like, I'm halfway there, y'all. Like, it's, like, it's getting, uh, the older we get, I think the more, not adjusted, but the more we realize that how, how short our window is here, right? Like, I think all of us would say, yes, uh, if not, you will get there. Like, teenager, like, one day life's going to speed up really fast. And you say, let's have more kids, so it's going to speed up faster, <laughs> right? But what happens is, is that, and I think it's important, I think that's why God led me here, because it's, it's never too soon to come to terms with the brevity of life. Right, if you're 18, 14, 35, 53, I just flipped that, anyway, or older. You know, I was telling Luke, and uh, actually, actually, I, w I always joke around that I want this tattoo of a skull on me just to remind myself of, of life, and actually, I see Lily, but I got Adam to draw one, so it's not quite as morbid, but it's got, like, flowers and stuff in it. They won't let me get it, uh, but where that comes from is... Uh, uh, I'm gonna hide. I'm gonna, it's gonna be somewhere. When, anyway, <laughs> derailed. Uh, where am I? At? But what medi medieval scholars actually would put a human skull on on their on their uh, on, in their office or whatever to remind themselves this life isn't forever. As a matter of fact, a lot of people actually believe. You know, churches we don't have one, but a lot of churches have cemeteries, and it wasn't just for convenience that a lot of times the churches have cemeteries to actually remind themselves, hey, this isn't forever. Like, like what we're doing means something. There is, there is an eternity, right? So it is convenient for churches to have cemeteries, but the reason why they started them is to always have it in their mind that they're living for something greater. Uh, and so th this is what we're seeing in the psalm is that as, as Moses is navigating the, the generation to generation, the everlasting to everlasting God, and in turn, Maybe burying his brother and a sister, you know, walking through that death and thinking about his own life, he understands, man, this is going to go by quick. Death is for sure for all of us. Which raises the question, because he answers it in the next couple of verses, why is that the case? All right, why do we have to die? Couldn't God just, you know, why, why, why and not only do we, why do we have to die, but why is, it so, why is life so brief? Why, why, is, why does 75 years seem like it's not that long of a time anymore? Right? Like why is everything so brief? And he actually answers it in verses 7 through 11 when he says this. Actually, that may be my third point. Yeah, number three is the judgment of the everlasting God. So he's a dwelling place. We think about him in those terms, but guess what? He's still a God of righteous judgment. So why do we have to die? It's because we sit under the judgment of an everlasting God. What he says in verses 7 through 11, he says, If we are brought to an end by your anger, your, by your wrath, we are dismayed. So we, we, are, we are brought to an end by your anger. This word he uses for anger here isn't like the word like an occasional God gets angry at us. 
It's more in the sense of a decision or a judgment God made in righteousness. And here we got to remember, we're talking about the same guy who wrote Genesis. Did you notice any of the language in Psalm 90 that sounds a lot like Genesis 3? What does he say in verse 3? Return man to what? Dust. Uh, Verse 10, for the years of our life are 70 or even reason of strength today, but they, what is it? But yet their span are toil and trouble. It's, It's Genesis 3 nuanced all the way through this. And so now Moses is saying that we die because it's the judgment of God. The brevity of our life is because the decision God made back in Genesis 3, right? Whenever he told Adam and Eve, what? If you disobey me in that day, you will surely die. Now, we know that he, they didn't die immediately because his grace, his mercy, he would have been just in wiping them out immediately. But he made provisions to cover up their nakedness, kicked them out of the garden to guard the way back so that he could make a way that eventually... Y'all, y'all heard me do this. In Genesis 3, we see him closing the, the garden up, right? The, the gates are closed. There's flaming swords and cherubim that are holding it to block the way from the tree of life. You know, it's really awesome. When we get to the book of Revelation at the very end, that same gate, the doors are wide open. It says, blessed are those who have the right back to the tree of life so they can wash their robes. So from Genesis 3 to the end of Revelation is God's plan to open those gates again. Right, you follow me? And so what we see is that by that pronouncement of judgment is that death came into the world after our, our sin. It was a decision that God has made. So we, God is everlasting, never lasting. We are finite, fragile, time stamped. And we, we, that is because the judgment of God on all of mankind. You starting to get gospel nuances now? It's about to get really good in a minute. Our mortality and the shortness of our lives is a direct result of God's judgment and consequence of man's sin. And he says in verse 11, And who considers the power of your anger, the wrath according to the fear of you? As in, who thinks about this often? Like when we think about life and death, and not often do we actually think, oh, we die because it's the judgment of God on mankind. And how does he, how does he describe it? He says that we are dismayed. Moses says, when we understand that you're everlasting to everlasting, and because of my sin, my life will end one day, in that state, we're dismayed. Like maybe we've been in church long enough that we forgot about that part of it. All right, but think about Think about, like, let's don't go, like, don't think about the cross. I know it, we, I can't say this, but don't, like, don't think about the provision you know that God has made for your sin. Think about just the fact if we were under the wrath of God. That's why he says we're dismayed. We're, we're messed up. We have no footing is what he's writing. And that's the f- point of the first 11 verses, y'all, <laughs> is that God is everlasting to everlasting. We're finite broken with a time stamp because of the judgment of God that's on our life. It's searing. And what does he say? Verse 12. So, teach us to number our days. Really, you could part, put that in the first half of what he's saying is, God, let us come to terms that our days are actually numbered. Like, let, us, let us actually receive that, accept that, that they, our days are actually numbered. And what does he say at the end of that? That we may gain, get a heart of wisdom. Number four, not only is the, we see the judgment of an everlasting God, number four, and I'm closing with this, is we see the steadfast love of the, of the everlasting God. Because you and I know, because we're 
post-resurrection, that the story doesn't end just in the judgment of God on us. That the story continues. And we can see a nuance all through here, beginning in verse 13. So here he is. Think about Moses dismayed at this moment, right? We got, we got to go back to the context. Brother, sister died. He's not going to the promised land. He's confessing to God, everlasting, everlasting. But I'm dismayed in my sinfulness and my brokenness. But now watch how he turns. Like the, I'm glad the psalm doesn't end there. In verse 13, 13, he cries out. So he's already praying, but now he's crying out. So it shifts gears to desperation. As, as Sarah was talking about earlier, this desperation, it says, uh, return, O Lord, how long? Have pity on your service. Do you know what Moses is actually praying God, will you do something to fix our problem? You're everlasting to everlasting, and in righteous, you pronounce the judgment on our sin. And now that we die and we're dismayed, but God, will you do something? Will you, will you, will you do something to help us out? Will you do something to fix it? That's what it's ultimately crying out. And check out in, uh, in verse uh, let's see, verse 13, the, the word he uses, Lord, there. Notice, go back to verse 1. You see, Lord with a, then it's lowercase o r d, that's Adonai. But now, whenever he, not summoned, but he calls out to the Lord for the Lord to, uh, to do something, he uses the covenant name. There's Lord, all capital letters, right? This is his covenant name that Luke talked about, was it last week, week before, two weeks ago, uh, the, the Lord there. And, and, and so he says, Lord, covenant Lord, everlasting, the one who's been a dwelling place from generation to generation, the one who called Abraham, Isaac, all those, like that God, I'm calling to you to, to do something. And check what he does in verse 14. He says, satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love. Check this out, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. So just in two verses, three verses, we're told to number our days, as in know our days are numbered, and just a couple verses later, that we may be glad in all of those days. So that's why I mean, when I'm not talking, we walk around and be Debbie Downers. Like, there is a gaining of wisdom and knowing our days are numbered that actually through Christ can be a gladness of days. Like this, this life we live, listen, we have an eternity that's going to be something beyond comparison, comparison, anyway. But God actually, even now we can be glad people. We can be joyful people. Right, we can actually listen to me, Christian. It's okay for us to smile and laugh. We don't have to be chosen frozen. Like we can we can enjoy life. We can enjoy we can worship God and enjoying his creation and enjoying each other's fellowship. This place can man, this morning I, I was encouraged because I don't know if I was just I don't know, but I noticed like for the like it was super loud in the foyer this morning because people were just talking. It was happening. I was like, "Yes, I got a headache now, but it's awesome." <laughs> right? Like we can be joyful people even on this side of eternity. How is that so? Because just for a couple of verses earlier, he was dismayed under the judgment of God. Well, we know the full story, but let me just give you a snippet of it. Is that he says, satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love. This word steadfast, it, it connects back to verse 2 from uh, that he is everlasting to everlasting. Remember, he's summoned and he's calling out to God using his covenant name, Lord. And now he's saying with your steadfast love, because something in Moses knew that God had promised that they wouldn't be smitten from him forever. That God was a covenant God, that he promised to be his people's God for the rest of forever. Right? He, he knew the promises of God. And so therefore, he calls out, says, God, in your steadfast love, will you fix our condition? That we may rejoice and be glad in all of our days. You can actually take all of these next couple of verses and, and tag the Lord before it. So he says, Lord, make us glad. Because at the moment, he wasn't very glad. 
right? Lord, let your work be shown to your service. Let us see your work. Lord, let us have favor before the Lord our God. May his favor be upon us. Here Moses is even, he's he's dismayed by the judgment on his sin. He's calling out for God to act in God's character towards his people. A steadfast love, it's, it's speaking of God's eternal and unbreakable commitment to love his people. It speaks of his eternal and absolutely reliable love. This covenant love is what he's speaking of. It flows from who he is. And here's the picture is that despite his judgment, God was still committed to love his people. Like, let that sit there for a moment. Verse 14, that you can have, you can rejoice and be glad all of your days. Like, let that sit on your shoulders when we think about what we looked at in verses 1 through 11. That God would still commit himself to love uh, unfaithful people. And what we understand through Christ is that this same steadfast love is what reverses everything. Like not only is this steadfast love important to understanding the psalm, but it's important to understanding mine and your life. Because God, what it says in Romans chapter 5, says while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one would scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare to even die. But verse 8 says, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God is an everlasting, everlasting God. Perfect, self-sufficient. We're broken, and because of that, the judgment of God was death. But God in his steadfast love sent another (laughs) to send another to absorb that wrath on a cross. Now here's the deal. We still still die. That judgment has been pronounced. But the New Testament writer says because of Christ that death has now what? Lost its sting. Because death, is, as we sing, is just a, a doorway into resurrection life. Death is a, just an entrance. It's what gets us to the presence of our great Savior. God did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. He reversed the judgment, now enables us to live with an abiding eternal joy in knowing Jesus Christ as Lord. Man, that's the gospel in Psalm 90. So what's the application of this? Just going back through is that God is God is everlasting. He's the same today, yesterday, tomorrow. No matter what you're walking through, if you can sympathize with Moses or not, I need to remind you that that's who God is. And I and, and I I call it this, I didn't preach on it all, but verse eight says, You have set our iniquities before you our secret sin in the light of your presence. So get the picture there. Each and every one of us, if the, I can't use this as in, because that may be sacrilegious, but if this was our sins, Psalm 90, verse 8 says, he has said it before him. And so not even the, even the ones that are not on the paper, the ones that are secret, that he's shined a flashlight on those. They're in the light of his presence. Listen to me. You are fully known yet still fully loved. We can't say that about a lot of humans. Oh, but that God who's everlasting to everlasting, the same God who spoke judgment said, when you sin, that's going to bring death, is the same God that says, I know you, yet I still sent my son to die for you. Somebody needs to be encouraged by that this morning. As Piper says, and you see this 
satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love. Did you know that that in Christ there is a satisfaction that the world cannot give? They cannot offer. Doesn't hold a candle to. And in Christ, God will satisfy every longing of your soul. Piper says that, as John Piper says, that God is most glorified in us when we're most satisfied in him. That God, Christ, is seen as the sufficient Savior, the, the good Savior. The good, good, God is seen as the good, good Father, if you will, when others, that he receives the most glory when others see the children of God satisfied in him. The children of God not running and chasing after everything else in the world, but there are actually people who are satisfied in who Christ is for them, and God gets most glory whenever we are most satisfied in who he is. The sermon I was going to preach is going to be something like this. Make the most of your days. (laughs) Because we don't know how long those days or how many days we're going to have. You know, I try to be that type of preacher. I'm just not that preacher, Luke. I can't do it. But real talk, let's make the most of the time that we have here. Intentionally loving our people. And say, hey, Justin, this church stuff... I don't get nothing out of Psalm 90. Here's what I, if, you, if you're not a Christian, here's what I need you to get out of Psalm 90. You were created for a purpose in a specific time. Your days were set before they started. That God in, in, in eternity past knew that in 2022 that you would be living in Laurel, Mississippi. He created you for a specific purpose in a specific time. Not because he was lonely, because he's, He's God from everlasting to everlasting. But in the goodness of who he is, in the the love of who he is in his character, he he decided to create man. Some thousands of years ago, he created a man and woman. They disobeyed. So you were created for a purpose at a specific time. But because of the sin in your life, you're separated from that purpose. That the judgment of God is still on you and it's a righteous judgment one day you will breathe your last breath nobody escapes that it doesn't matter if you believe you will or not (laughs) our days are numbered justly but here's what I really need you to get you Get you, get you to get this morning, is that of the steadfast love of the God that we rejected, he sent a Savior. That whenever you do die, it's not something to fear. It's something to anticipate. As Paul in Philippians, I don't know if I'm going to live or die. My, my will is to die and go be with the Lord, but beneficial for you a few minutes to stay here so if I live as Christ but die is gain that could be you (laughs) you were to ask today what's the greatest fear among humans it's death not necessarily how you're going to I'm not not necessarily when you're going to die but me it's like how am I going to die like I've always just and I've been honest with y'all about that in the years past I'll just kind of got consumed with that a couple years ago like, and it led to some just weird weird stuff <laughs> but how we're going to hey here's the good news is that the God who Moses cried out to in Psalm 90 answered his prayer in a man named Jesus God do something to fix our dismayed condition before you God answered that prayer when he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross and all you have to do is trust in him. I'm going to pray, and the band's going to come out and lead us. And today, do you need to call out to the Lord in salvation and say, Lord, I, I, want, to, I want to believe. I want to, get, I want to be saved. Maybe you need to just kind of 
spend some time where you are in the Lord's presence. And if you don't learn anything through the book of Psalms, maybe you learn this, that everything that we're walking through are, is the, the, the people who's writing it, processing what's going on in the presence of God. So maybe you just can learn that from Psalms. That it's okay to go to God with my struggles and be honest with him. I'll be standing down here in the front and Luke will be in the back. I know, I think Ryan's somewhere back there. You make your way and be obedient. Father, we love you. God, we thank you for your love for us. God, we thank you for your word. Thank you for Psalm 90 that even we can look at this. This psalm that was written whenever the children of Israel in the wilderness and we can see your deliverance in Christ. We can see the gospel. God, remind us of that this morning. Of how hopeless we were. But how, God, you made a way. God, Lead us during this time. May we respond in a way that is obedient to you. It's in Christ's name. I'm going to ask you to stand. Uh, The band's going to lead us in a song that we know well. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood, and I don't think it could be any more appropriate with with the text that understanding. So when we're singing this, thank you, Jesus, for the blood, like think about that dismayed moment in verses 10 and 11 there. (laughs) That we're, we're under the judgment of God, but through his steadfast love he sent Christ and because of the the blood of Jesus you and I now don't sit under condemnation but we sit as sons and daughters sit as family so let's don't sing this song let's don't just look back and go man Sarah can sing real well or man Luke can really play that guitar and let's connect and literally be as the Moses like thank you Jesus for the blood (laughs) because apart from it there is no hope so this song isn't a buffer for you to walk out the door this song is a is a response to the word that we just heard and we're going to thank god for for his son's blood Amen? amen let's do it